All right, but so welcome to everybody. Um, first of all, I will read the, the, the blessing. I'll do it in English. The blessing is, as we deliberate on the issues before us, we trust that we will reflect positively on the communities we serve. Let us all seek to be effective and just, so that with courage, vision and energy, we provide positive leadership in a spirit of harmony and compassion. Thank you, everybody. Uh, what apologies do we have? Any, any formal apologies from members? Uh, I'll just note that Mark de Haast is, is way ill at the moment, uh, and his place today is being taken by Andrew Purvin, who's acting group manager. All right. Um, other faces here. I'll, do, I'll just introduce new faces while I'm talking about apologies. All right. We've got Ian Georgeson here, who will be um, acting. CFO while Jean is on secondment uh, to do something very important, I understand. Um, and we have uh, David Cochran is joining us from the Gold Coast, where apparently it's raining. Um, it's yeah, raining. It's, yep. <laughs> there we are. Uh, we have visitors, uh, Dan Neely and Scott Dre from the Regional uh, Emergency Management Organisation. Uh, we'll talk to them later on in the when they make the presentation on... Um, Emergency recovery, um, and we will be joined online by Ahmed from Ernst and Young at some stage for those items on the audit matter. All right. Okay. Uh, item number three. Are there any declarations of interest relating to items on the agenda? It is noted that there appear to be none. Thank you very much. Um, Public speaking, has anyone indicated a desire to come and talk to us? No. Deputations? No. Right. This is easy so far, isn't it? Right. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, updates from the chair, leave of absence. No leave of absence has been requested. Um, what do you mean by that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to mention that in a minute, yes. Um, look, uh, I just want to, uh, to alert you here to a slight change in the agenda, which we discussed at the preparatory meeting yesterday. Uh, I've, I indicated to Mark um, that I think there are two important matters which have occurred recently, uh, which should be at least discussed or presented at least briefly to this committee. And the first one is the credit rating report from Standard & Poor's, uh, which has reaffirmed the council's rating. Um, I believe it would be useful to have a brief discussion on that, and I think uh, Darren will start with a conversation on that. And the second is government announcements recently concerning water reforms. Again, I think this is a matter which impinges quite significantly on financial risk, and I think we just should have a, a quick uh, update on that and what and what might be happening or what could happen there. And I've, I'll ask um, uh, Darren, you'll lead with that, or... or uh, all right. So, look, that was the first thing I wanted to do, to have these two brief discussion items, um, and then we'll proceed through the agenda as set out in the, in the, in the formal documents. Just on the credit rating, um, this came out. There was a council press release, as you would have seen uh, earlier in the week. Um, there is, uh, uh, there was, I think all of you received, all councillors received a copy of the report, courtesy of... Um, What's his name? <laughs> I keep forgetting. Pat Dignan. Uh, Pat Dignan, former uh, well-known Waikanae resident uh, beach uh, activist um, uh, and a former head of the debt management office in the Treasury. He has uh, se he sent it round to you, uh, so you can read it. You may have read it, you may not have read it, but it has been sent to you. But it is something I think we should just dwell on, and I just make the point that the reason I'm bringing it, I'm, I've suggested that it come forward here, is that I think this is a risk, an important risk issue which should be discussed on an occasional basis as it occurs and that if there is a home for credit ratings in the council, it really belongs in this committee, right? So, and the same, I think, with the water reforms, which do have important long-term ramifications as well as, of course, impinging on the long-term plan. So, Darren, can I ask you to start with something about the report from Standard & Poor's, which was basically good news, but it had a barb behind it, as credit rating agencies' reports often do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, morning.
morning, everyone. Uh, and, 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 and probably t timely, right, to, to be thinking about this. Um, so, so the recent uh, S&P Global uh, credit rating held us at AA with a negative outlook, which is the same as what we had last year. Um, so so be before we think about what that means, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to actually acknowledge and celebrate the, the fact that our credit rating wasn't downgraded and we've held. And we've talked a lot through the preparation of the long-term plan about the financial pressures uh, and council needing to balance um, what cost delivery and affordability looks like. Um, and so we've landed in a really, really good space. If I think about the um, highlights um, from Standard & Poor's, uh, talked about the fact that council had committed to increasing rates. Um, also talked about the fact that council had a, 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 a strong financial strategy that one looked at reducing borrowings and then looked to reduce debt. Um, so those were three key things um, that um, Standard & Poor's uh, highlighted through the report. When we think about the negative outlook, uh, again, it's about the rising debt levels uh, that Council will be taking on uh, due to the fact that our Capital Works program continues to be um, aggressive, I would say. You know, we've gone from, um, and, I, and I'll use um, Sean's words, we've gone from a council that delivered about $25 million a year in Capital Works program to the most recent financial year where we delivered $82 million. The forecast for the three years ahead, between $70, $75 million of capital delivery um, per annum. Which is a, which is a uh, which is a positive, but also brings with it a burden of, of debt, uh, and so that was something that Standard and Poor's uh, highlighted that we would need to be cognizant of. Also, um, we have to be mindful of what we can actually deliver. Uh, what is the workforce capability uh, nationally and globally actually to be able to continue to to deliver at that pace, uh, and also government reforms. Um, you, you, you know, I, uh, I reflect back on the previous government and I thought that reform program uh, was optimistic and aggressive. I, I sit back now and I, and I look at what is ahead and what is coming with current reforms um, and it just seems to be getting quicker and quicker. Uh, the pace and the expectation uh, without any thought about what the cost of impl implication for local government New Zealand uh, is in that space, and so Standard and, and Poor's are very mindful of what that will mean for us uh, and waters. Local water done well. Um, we are still in the early stages. We in the Wellington region have signed up to a an MOU, uh, which in principle lets us talk about what um, regional development looks like in the water space, and we'll talk about that, that shortly. So, so, so that, that's probably the, the, the highlight from me. Um, I, I would encourage you to read to read the full report. It's not that wordy, uh, and it is in plain English, and it, it does make sense. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm happy to take questions, but I'm also um, happy for uh, regular reporting. I think is probably an opportunity for us to to consider as to how we keep a standard and pause the credit rating and financial risk at front of mind for us. Thank you, Dan. I'd just add very briefly when you'd read the report itself. As Darren says, it's quite short and quite easy to read. Um, it makes some comments and puts capita in the context of New Zealand local government generally, which it sees basically as being well run uh, and having sound sources of revenue, despite uh, and um, significant funding from uh, a, a, a very certain source of finance, if you put it that way. Uh, it does talk in the case of capita about the continuing capital account deficit, which is another way of saying that we're still borrowing uh, too much uh, proportionally, that we should be financing a greater percentage of our uh, capex capital expenditure from current revenues rather than from uh, borrowing. Uh, but that's something which, which, I mean, in a sense, has been started to be addressed by the whole long-term long financial strategy, which is reflected in the long-term plan. So I just make those comments, and I'll see if there are any other questions or comments that. Anyone would want to wait? The Mayor, first of all. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the finance team on retaining our credit rating, um, particularly in the context of many other councils and local government in general dropping. So I think it's a real achievement and a testament to the vigilance that has been exercised, not just recently, but over many years, um, but particularly recently as we deal with the challenges that have been in front of us. And also uh, the uh, good governance of the elected members in terms of um, keeping a, a sharp eye over our financial management and making that the focus of our long-term plan. I think that's something that landed really well in terms of um, our conversations with Standard & Poor's. The um, other point that the Chair made around uh, government reforms being a uh, matter for this committee I'd be keen to see that added formally into the delegations, um, keeping an overview over the implications of central government reforms on and other external factors influencing council's operations. So um, I'll chat that through with staff and see if that can be can be progressed. In the meantime, it, it falls under the general delegation of the committee, but I think it would be good to highlight that so that we um, keep an overview within this group. And um, regarding water reform, I certainly think that that's something which is a matter for this committee to keep oversight of. Um, I'm starting to feel slightly uncomfortable, I'll just be really open about this, with the pace at which um, the regional work is moving and our ability to do um, the analysis and the work that we need to do to understand the implications and the benefits or otherwise of um, forming various entities. And I've expressed that um, to the group. And uh, there'll be an opportunity for other elected members to come and have a catch up, um, I think it's on the 30th of August, um, to have a look at that themselves and get, get all the information firsthand from the working party. And I'm just wondering if it might be possible for me to ask if that invitation can be also extended to our independent members of Audit and Risk. Not sure if that's going to be possible, but certainly after that there'll be an opportunity to update this committee. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just quick, just got a quick response for I called Bernard. Um, uh, Darren very kindly, courteously uh, asked me to, invited me to go along, but I'm not going to be able to do that because I won't I'll be out in the country, but perhaps David would be able to take that up. That's, mm -hmm. that's useful. But it would also be taking your comment about the role of the committee, uh, but it might also be useful to receive any views from members as to whether they're comfortable with this sort of, uh, um, we have a sort of informal expansion of the role of the committee into certain things, such as emergency management, uh, which we've already adopted, but not formally, right? So uh, just, I, I think we, it would be important for other members of the committee to be comfortable with sort of uh, the home of credit rating and water reform somehow being attached to this committee. But anyway, I leave, leave it open to people to comment. Bernard, you were yeah, one of um, the Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just through you, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to know our borrowings. Um, is our borrowings for this current financial year more or less than what we've borrowed in previous financial years? And is there, is there a, um, a trend? And do is there a trend to go to um, go downwards, and then step, follow up about the water, um, the water reform? Is council still expecting a current six or seven percent rate increase for the next three or four years? Well, that's quite a broad question. Um, I wonder who should respond to it, Darren. Uh, Thank you. Um, yes, is, is, is the answer. Obviously, when you when your capital works program goes from twenty five million dollars per annum to to seventy five, um, there is an uplift uh, in, in debt, and we can we continue to see that uplift. Um, but what gives me a level of comfort is that we took a hundred million dollars of capital works expense out of the budget. You know, so we, we reduce that down. The financial strategy is really clear in what it wants us to achieve, uh, which is a, um, a, a zero balance sheet, I guess, for, for, for want of a, a loose term, where 
where we reduce the need to borrow in the first five years, and then from year six onwards we start to reduce the debt. You know, so um, the challenge for us, uh, as with any um, any organisation, is to hold to that strategy uh, and not let ourselves uh, be distracted um, by opportunities or um, shiny things that come along that we want to grab hold of uh, and, and look to influence or, or deliver. Um, and then the second bit about uh, water. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so I, I, I'm constantly reminded, um, and, and thank you for doing so to our, um, to our council laws, uh, that 7% that, that isn't a target, it's a ceiling. Yeah, you know, and, and, and so um, we will be working tirelessly over the coming months to ensure that we are able to not hit that target. <laughs> yeah. If I could just add a bit quick before we move on, if you read the, rep the, the report from the agency, one important quote is, Kapiti's large capital program and pre-funding strategy, you know we have that strategy as part of the Treasury Managed Strategy, will continue to add to its debt, but solid growth and operating revenues. Now that's another way of saying rates increases, I suppose. Solid solid growth in, in, uh, in operating revenues is another word for that. Will contribute to a gradual decline in the ratio of tax uh, of tax supported debt to operating revenue. In other words, our debt servicing charges are going to go down on the longer term. And that's also a favourable point that they comment on, as well as some favourable comments generally about our liquidity management policy, which is a very important thing, and I think we've often noted before. That the quality of our Treasury management is a very important thing that the ratings agencies look at. Right? Uh, I think, Liz, you were next, and then Glenn. No, Glenn's next. Okay. Well, you go, Glenn. Uh, so this may actually fall into the next round of uh, questions around water reform, but, but it seems to me that... Um, our economic strategy of reducing debt, which is a good strategy, is in direct conflict with central government's intent to borrow to the hilt to pay for water reform and just borrow to the hilt without any plan around paying the borrowing back. So how does that, how does that sit with us in terms of our strategic intent is the opposite to the war reform central government intent, because the rubber the, the, the rubber hits the road here with us, not the central government. Could I just so suggest that we come to that when we come specifically to war, to the war plan, okay. all right? But but I think it, it's worth noting that it's not requiring you to borrow. It's giving you it's giving some agent some subject to certain conditions. It's giving councils the opportunity to, to borrow more, as a result of which the mayor of Pyrrha and the mayor of Upper have said hallelujah. Um, which is somewhat different to... Yeah. Uh, to well, I guess that's the question, here. isn't it? Is, is, does that change... What, how does that change the CE's and Well, I think we can... We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that uh, yeah. when Thank Darren you. Talk, talks on the water reforms. And okay. would that affect... Force? Thank you, Glenn. OK. okay. Liz? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. I'm just responding to your comments about bringing in the credit rating and the water reforms. And I'm wondering whether we need a standing item on our agenda, which is around environmental scanning and risk factors because I see the role of this committee as very much one of, let's keep an eye on what, what's going on out there that's impacting on the risks for this organisation. And I think we need to be quite responsive uh, and, uh, uh, on, the, on those uh, matters. So I think it, it just would be useful, I think, to have at the start of our agenda some time to reflect on, is there anything going on out there that impacts on this organisation? Let's just think about some things that we need to perhaps focus on in a little bit more detail uh, so that we n nothing um, escapes our attention that might have a, uh, uh, a negative impact. Or alternatively, I guess there's some positive things that might be happening as well that might reduce our risk. Uh, but I, I just, yeah, just do wonder whether we need some sort of a standing agenda item in that regard. Well, if there's general support for this, I think, as, as the Mayor suggested, we'll ask the Mayor and the Chief Executive to consult together and to come up with some possible amendment to terms of reference and so on, which would, which would reflect this home within the... Uh, home being homed within this committee. All right? OK. Chair, can I ask a question, please? Who, who are you? We can't see you. David. David. 
David. Oh, David. There, yeah, where are yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I can, I, well, I can sorry, become visible. Where are there you? Go. I see you. Uh, there, yeah, there we are. There um, we are. I, look like, you look like you're at a country club, David. You, you I sure wish I was. I wish it was my country, my country retreat, but it's not. It's the, it's the golf club. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the bunkers are a giveaway. Uh, <laughs> can I just ask about the, um, the the credit rating? We dropped, I think, from AA neutral to AA negative, and that, I think everyone suffered that hit. I agree with what the mayor said about it's been great holding the fort. Um, uh, do we have any? Do we do? I, I haven't seen the Standard Pools report, but I'll, if you send it to me, I'll read it. Um, how do we compare with other councils? Uh, are other councils going down, going up, holding the same? I mean, I, I, I mean, we we held our our way, and the press release was great. But are other councils improving or decreasing or staying neutral? Thanks for that question, Darren. You'd like to respond to that? Yeah. Yep. Thanks, David. Um, it's probably something that we don't focus uh, a, a, a lot on, right? We 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 tend to, well, I I tend to try and work collectively, collegially rather than being overly competitive. Um, but we are holding really, really well within the region. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of specifics, but I understand some councils have shifted downward, uh, whereas we have, we have held that AA rating as a negative outlook. Yeah, thanks. No, I don't want to start a competition. I just, just worry about the trend. If everybody else was rising and we were sitting still, we'd be, oh, what's going on? Or if we're holding still and everyone else is dropping, well, that's pretty good. Um, but unless we know what's going on around in the world around us, as Liz just said, what's going on in the outside world, um, we, get, we run the risk of, of praising ourselves in our own little bubble. And I'd just like to get a wider picture if we can, but it might come out of that report. Thanks. Thank you, David. Darren, I'll invite you now just to make some quick comments on the water issues if you wish to, right? A lot happening uh, and a lot in the press about it and some reactions from other mayors which are somewhat different to this council's policy. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, water reform. So, so, so as, a, I guess as a region, um, again, we, we have been working um, collaboratively together qu quite nicely uh, and looking at how we can uh, deliver water services through a regional model to align with local water done well. Right, the, the, the government has, has set some, some clear expectation um, around water services being delivered better, uh, wider regulatory reforms, um, economic reg regulation, uh, consumer protection and affordability, really big things. Um, and some of the guidance that we've been given uh, through operating models at a regional level are to look at um, what CCO options look like. CCOs that own the assets are responsible for the debt, um, which re removes that debt from council's balance sheet uh, and runs pr pretty much a, a, a separate entity. Um, the requirement to have water services uh, included in the long-term plan is removed, uh, so so there's no need for us to um, to consult on that. However, there is a um, there is a requirement for the home council to be a guarantor what that looks like uh, we're not too we're not too sure yet um, and so if i just touch back on the fact that on the, the 30th of, of this month in the hut there is a uh, a regional workshop for all councillors um, and, and i would encourage you to um to come along to that uh, if you're able to we're putting on a uh, on a bus so that everyone can can come it's the 30th of, of August, so there's, an, there's an invitation in the calendars. Um, so it will be. It's not for community board members. It's just for councillors. Um, I did. I did ask that question, um, and then it's for for each council to up, update their 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 wider elected members when they come back from that. Um, so so that will be a really good workshop. Um, the, probably the reason why you haven't heard a lot is that it is very early stages. Uh, we've committed to an MOU, we've committed to work together and to understand what that means for Kapiti. Uh, the Mayor has made it quite clear that we have um, a, a gateway in our standing orders where if we are to transfer water assets we need to go to a referendum. 
with our communities. You know, so that's very different to all of our other councils. Um, but setting that aside, we are very different to all of the other councils in that our water services are in really good condition. Uh, and that's because of the investment that this council has put uh, in its water services and its assets. Uh, probably the biggest shift that this council made was water meters, uh, which a lot of the other councils haven't followed. And that has, um, that's really paid dividend in that the last 10 years has not seen water restrictions uh, here in, the, in, in Kapiti, whereas our neighbors uh, continue to suffer from that. So, so the decision point will be based around uh, community aspiration, uh, community desire, uh, affordability, and I think um, economic common sense, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Um, we will need to understand if there's any need for a cross subsidisation, uh, how we continue to deliver our capital works program that will transfer into a new entity if, the, if that's what, what, what does happen. Uh, also what um, pricing looks like. You, you, you know, uh, if you look at what you pay for electricity and you look at what you pay for water, look at what your insurance bills are, there's going to be a discussion about what uh, the cost of water is. Um, and then we talk about funding options and financing options. Uh, so the, the, the government has indicated that the new water entities that sit outside of council will be able to raise up to 500% borrowings of the revenue. Now that sounds like a lot, right? So if you think about council and its, its headroom of 280% of revenue, and you think about how big our revenue is as an organisation, so just say 100 million uh, in revenue as, a, as an example, and you can go to 280% raising debt, the same applies to a water entity if it's established as a CCO at 500%. But if your revenue for that water entity is only $20 million, that's the difference. It's 500 up to 500% of $20 million, not of $100 million that your council has through its revenue. So, so, so there's a lot to consider uh, in that. And so that's just about economic common sense. Right, because the water entity will be required to pay for water services and deliver those water services if that's the option that council chooses to do. So, so there's, a, there's a lot in there, right? So, so I come back to Glenn's uh, comment before we, we take some further questions or, or, or comments. Uh, if you think about our financial strategy, our long-term plan, our water services are in there for the next 10 years of the long-term plan. And everything that we want to deliver is budgeted uh, for the first three years and you come back for the next three years and, and have that conversation. So there's some real certainty there for us and it aligns to our financial strategy. So again, really confident that as a council, um, you've signed off on, on what that looks like for us. So, so, so I will probably finish with saying at some point we're, we are going to have a real hard conversation uh, about what is best for the region or what is best for Kapiti. Thanks, thanks, Darren. I'll just make one quick comment. I mean, there was a lot of suggestion in the early publicity concerning these reforms that you would have to form a CCO or, some, or enter into a regional organisation to access this sort of arrangement. But when you read the fine prints, it says councils will also retain the ability to, if they retain it, their services in the house to do that. So there is that option. Um, I made gratuitous comments at earlier meetings here about this proposal, and I basically, you know, for what it's worth, I, I just can't see what the benefits to this council might be of entering into a regional organisation, given this, as the, the points that Darren has just made. But uh, it could well be that the government might force us, uh, might force you, right? Uh, that could well happen. Who knows, all right? I mean, because people talk about regional, well, local water done well. I, I mean, I think Capity is a good illustration of that, frankly. But, uh, and local water done well is not necessarily the same as regional water done well. Uh, anyway, I leave it at that. Uh, any further questions or comments uh, from any other member? Martin. Yeah, look, having been here in the last triennium, I just wanted to let everyone know that that summary I thought we got from the CEO was excellent. 
uh, with regards to what our position is. Um, to me, this is just the same thing that was proposed by Labour, to be honest. Uh, it's not, not that much different at all. It's just called something a bit different. But the fundamentals are pretty much all the same uh, and that sort of stuff. And all the um, all the rhetoric that we uh, just talked to, uh, all the issues that we discussed last time uh, with regards to this as well, uh, we are in a very good position with our water and the whole issue is around that cost subsidising as well. There's been a lot of work done in this space with regards to information about about what our situation is. The Costello reports, uh, I, think, I think it was Costello, uh, Mayor Holborough, that we had last year, uh, last Trinium, um, that, that double-checked the government's information. All that information will pretty much will still be relevant, I dare say, uh, as we move forward. So there will be a lot of information that we can use that we've actually already done the research in with regards to our position. We certainly aren't going to be starting from ground zero in this space, but just because it's called something different, it actually what I can see isn't really that much different, uh, to be honest. Um, and um, yeah, and so uh, we're obviously we're on top of this and we will need to have hard discussions, but hopefully this time around, uh, the referendum aspect of um, what we have in, in our, um, uh, in our um, district plan will be able to be taken effect and not just overrun like they were last time uh, as such. But then again, who knows? Um, but I think we're in a pretty good space with regards to being able to make informed decisions for the um, better of our community. Thank you, Martin. Janet? No, yeah. So during the previous round of reforms, there was work done oh. on the state of the infrastructure, oh. not only in Kapiti, but across the region. But we have new information coming in around that all the time, as, because it's not as, you know, it's a lot, of it, a lot of it you can't see. And the extent of the Kaikoura earthquake, for instance, is only being understood now. Um, so we don't have all the information that we need. And the information that we're starting to get, some of it we need to look at again because we're not convinced that it's accurate. And also the quantum of the infrastructure deficit across the region just seems to be increasing stratospherically. So, um, yeah, certainly there's, there's still work to be done in that space. We, we, we don't have a full analysis of the quantum or the nature of the problem and the challenges that we face. Thank you, Janet. Lawrence. Oh, what, just very quickly, Sorry. what sort of timing are we thinking? Would we expect this a referendum would be in the next election or we would be oh. a... How long is a piece of string? But there must be some sort of... Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. And, and sorry, I should have cut you off. Um, so, so we've really only just started looking at those timelines, and, and that comes back to the to the mayor's comment of, uh, of, about the level of concern. It's really aggressive. F first quarter of next year, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's really aggressive. So, so, so that's why there's uh, yeah, yeah, there's a fair bit of concern around that. With everything else that we are dealing with, right? That everyone nationally is dealing with. Lawrence, it's now your turn. Yes, thank you. Great. The reason I um, deferred there was I was wanting to come back to your question about whether the committee was happy with an increased oversight. Mm. Um, and I hadn't responded to that. So I, I think it's important, from my perspective, I think it's important that Risk and Assurance has this oversight of the hazards that are coming down the track towards us and the risks that those pose uh, to us as council, um, especially with the independence that you bring and Mr Cochrane brings as well. I think um, oh, very important. Thank you, Lawrence. All right, anything further? Sorry, oh, yeah, just a very quick Sorry, Richard, question. Yes. Trying to understand the um, transfer out of the assets, the debt associated with those assets transfer out as well. Because um, I think a lot of our debt is around water um, and if we transfer it out, we don't get the benefits of cross-subsidisation from ordinary rates to, to pay debt. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good point. And, and, and that is probably the key difference from the, the previous water reform, where um, the debt was re repaid uh, and it went into uh, a, a mandated... Uh, service delivery model, um, whereas whereas here it's um, it's it's optional. You know the the, the the onus is put on local government to 
to form these entities. So the, the debt goes with the asset to that new entity. Uh, the new entity is then responsible for servicing the debt and the growth. Nothing further. I think we'll move back to the uh, formal agenda as there, but uh, we'll consult with the mayor. The mayor and uh, Darren might, might consult about uh, making some tweaking of the terms of reference to pick up the point that's been made, and I appreciate your comments, Sorens, which I think are, are very good. Okay. Um, there's nothing further under matters of an urgent nature or members' business. Uh, then we move to item on the discussion of recovery as the second component of the emergency management program. So, Chris, you'll come forward, won't you? And we have get two guests here who will come forward, uh, Dan Neely and Scott Dray from the Wellington Regional Emergency Management Office. All right. Uh, and we do have a presentation here. You'll recall that um, earlier at our February meeting, I think it was, we had a presentation from officers concerning emergency management uh, response, and this is about emergency management recovery. All right? Okay. Your hands, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. Um, I we, we do have a small presentation today, uh, and I think I wanted to just open with, um, you have a paper which we will take as read. You'll note that today um, we don't have any uh, decisions or options. It's more providing an update to you on where we're at with um, our first discussion around recovery, which is part of our emergency management program. Um, I do want to start with uh, a bit of a welcome. I think the chair did mention that we have um, a, a bigger team with us today, but because it's our first discussion, I thought we would come in full force. So um, I do want to introduce you to our team from Reba. Um, so um, I will say we have Dan and Scott, um, and, and they'll talk a bit more about themselves shortly. And just down the other end of the room, um, we have uh, Bridget, Gina and Nicole, who at our end and in the presentation are pretty much smack in the middle of recovery. So we have a small crew of people and what you're going to hear is actually quite a massive um, area of focus. Um, and, and really today we're talking to you about what recovery is, um, uh, uh, why uh, we're focused on it now, and what we've learnt actually from some of the big events that have occurred nationally. We were going to add a bit in there and say, and internationally. So um, some of the work that we've been um, engaged in with Remo has actually been around getting our foundations in place, but also leveraging off the fact that um, the need for recovery is not new, but it's completely underdone and it comes at a cost. And so we are going to talk a little bit about that with you today. Oh. Happy to take questions. Oh, do you want to comment? Very quick. Yes, I just, sure, I just, sure. I just want a quick question in terms of context. Um, second component, I'm going to ask a really dumb question. What is the first component? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, happy to do that. Response. Yes, we are, we are going to get into this. So the, the Remo team will, will cover this a bit. But in our emergency management framework, this committee has previously heard from our, our team about response. And so um, that's in the, in, when a, an event happens, the first thing we do is get right into response mode. And the way that I'll frame it in a very simple terms is that's where we're literally and they might be saving people who, who might be caught or stuck. It's that immediate what we need to do. What we're about to talk to you about is um, sometimes that might be a six-week process or a two-month process and everyone goes, yay, we did it in a big event. Unfortunately, it doesn't end there. And some of the examples we can give you around Christchurch or even what we've seen with Cyclone Gabriel, two, three, five years later, we're still in recovery mode. And so that's the bit we're talking about. It's the bit that um, is not really talked about, but that um, is massive, takes a lot of time. There's no 
there's no mandate. You don't get special powers and there's often no money. So so that's what we're here to talk to you about um, is that we actually have um, uh, some work we are progressing so that we are well placed to, um, to get into that mode to make sure that we can do the things that we're actually legislatively required to do for our community. And so we're going to shape that for you today. Um, and I don't want to take all the thunder away because um, these guys will be able to explain this far better than I can. Um, so um, we're going to hear from Remo first because I think they are regional partners and they actually have a lead at a regional level um, if an emergency happens. And so we're working really closely with them in response and recovery. And so we're going to talk about that today. Yeah, so I will hand over to Dan and Scott for our next uh, couple of slides. Right on. Kia ora, everybody. Um, so yeah, my name is Daniel Neely. I'm the manager of community resilience and the group recovery manager for the Wellington region over at Remo. Um, I always introduce myself as a community development person who works in emergency management. Um, I've been in this job for about 15 years here in New Zealand. You can hear by my accent, I'm not originally from New Zealand. I'm from Arizona. Um, and I've worked internationally in dis large scale disaster recovery for many years before emigrating to New Zealand 17 some odd years ago. Um, I just also really wanna recognize how happy I am to be here today because having been in this job for 15 years, this is the first time I've ever spoken to a council about pre-disaster recovery planning. And I think that is a huge um, step forward for this council. Props to Chris for really being a firecracker and an advocate in this space. Um, we've seen over the years, going back to Christchurch and events prior to that, just how demanding recovery is, both on councils and communities. Um, and it's just been a, you know, a, a kind of a mind-boggling experience for me over the years to why councils aren't leaning into this when, the, when they know that these are the types of planning risks that are in front of them. So huge props to the team for making this investment. I think it, some of the conversations in the lead up to this um, are so intertwined with recovery as well. It, it's actually quite a holistic approach. So um, maybe is that, what am I looking at my first slide? Why, why now, right? I think that's maybe a, an opener right there. Um, Chris alluded to it. Having been in this sector for a long time, we often, when we think emergency management, we think response, right? And we think about you know, the stuff that goes boom and the, and the stuff that gets broken. Um, what we have not historically done very well is think about the aftermath of response and the people and the families and the communities and the economies that get broken from those events and how councils play such an integral role with the social contract of their communities to help convene all the many players that need to be required for not just months, but often years, right? So uh, when we came out of the cyclone um, a couple of years ago, you guys will remember probably where in the wide app, but just, you know, they, they, were, they were lightly affected out of that cyclone. Um, when, we were, when Scott and I were talking to them out of that event, the initial thinking out of the council was like, yep, we'll get a mayor relief fund and we'll kind of knock this out in the next couple of months and it'll be done. And we were saying, this will likely be, even though this is a relatively small event, this will be years in the making for your council. And at the time there was like, nah, you know, it'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get through this. We just, you know, a few, few households, they're two years in and they're knee deep in it right now, right? So it just kind of goes to show that even the small events are hugely taxing, not just on your communities, not just on your council, um, but the council staff that are working in that space. So what this is about is actually starting to prepare. How do we, how do we lean into this so we can make that transition out of response as seamless and as fluid as possible, not just for your council, but for your communities? So maybe if you could just, are, are, you, the, are you the official clicker? I'm gonna go yeah. click. Um, make the, to maybe start at a macro level, right? Um, there's a 75% chance that the Alpine Fault, if you're, hopefully everybody's kind of aware of the Alpine Fault, right? 75% um, chance that's gonna go off in the next 50 years, that it'll be an eight, plus event, a magnitude, magnitude eight plus event, that will reshape New Zealand when that goes off. So almost certainly within our lifetimes, but certainly within our kids' lifetimes, New Zealand Inc. is gonna experience that event, right? That will reshape this country. 25, what we don't have up there is a 25% chance right now of the Hikarangi Fault going off. That will be, a, if, you're, if you remember 2011 Japan where they had the tsunami, that, with, that is basically what we'll experience here in the Wellington region with that earthquake, with that level of earthquake, that'll be like a 9.0. That'll be an earthquake and tsunami for the Wellington region. I'm not into scaremongering. It's not, that's not what I'm trying to do out of this, but I am trying to frame like the challenges are very real for us and we have a tendency as human beings to go like, ah, it'll be fine, right? We'll deal with it when we get there. Um, these are pretty big risks that are, that are on, on the charts for us. Can you click to the next slide? 
Um, and, that, and that's just one of many, right? I think uh, probably the, you know, that's kind of your worst case scenario stuff. The realistic scenario stuff that is very much on our front door every year, it's a bit of a gamble, is climate change, right? We're seeing those effects um, ramp up. I've got a, a in hindsight, I put, should have put this slide in from the United States that shows the cost in billions of dollars that the United States is spending on events each year. And it's just like going straight up based on flood events and severe weather events. And we're seeing that in New Zealand as well, right? So um, the chance sooner or later of us having that kind of big weather event starting to happen across the country is, is going up right around, um, right around for us. And how do we prepare not just for that response, but how do we transition right out of that response to make sure we have continuity for our councils, continuity for our communities? That's all part of what pre-disaster recovery planning is. That's what the team is doing here. Scott, you want to just maybe talk to a couple of these slides? Kia ora koutou. Of course, Scott Dre, Taka Wingwa. Um, some familiar faces here today. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background about me. Um, I actually uh, have worked with younger versions of both Darren and Glenn in Kaitaia and Kapiti and the police. It's surprising it's such a small world. Um, and quite a few familiar faces here within council as well. I spent um, about eight years in the strategy and partnerships team working as a policy writer, principal rural fire officer and CDM controller. Um, and have been with Dan and the team within Remo for the last 13 years, working in a variety of different roles and currently specialising in uh, recovery for the Wellington region. So I'm really, really pleased that I'm no longer working in isolation. There's actually going to be some BAU staff that I can work alongside, particularly in here in Kapiti. So again, I, will, I really commend Chris and the team and be able to get, get that across the line. And I'm going to just um, emphasise a few of the key points that Dan just raised around the threat profile. Again, we're not here to scaremonger, but we are just here to really emphasise the fact that um, we're not, this is not if, it's when these things are going to occur. And they're going to be existential threats to the ongoing viability of our communities. Um, it's going to require an all of government approach, all of community approach, um, because what makes recovery so important, and one of the reasons why it's consistently um, not given the, um, the relevance that it's due, is that response saves in the lives of individuals, recovery saves the live livelihoods of entire communities. Um, and, and we need to be mindful of that. Um, Darren was just talking about the fact that you want to make sure that you maintain your financial strategy and don't get uh, waylaid by nice shiny things. Recovery is a not a nice shiny thing, but it is one of those little hiccups that can significantly impact your financial plans. And the only way you can mitigate that is by actually spending some time and effort pre-event to think about what can we do to ensure that we are well positioned to take the most of the opportunities to access external funding, um, external support, external resources, make sure that we have structures in place so that we're well coordinated and can work in a collaborative, coordinated way with our partners, with our central government um, and with our communities. What we have seen from these recent events such as Cyclone Gabriel and the impacts that it has had on other councils and their communities is that no longer will communities accept that councils were unprepared for these risks, that they did not have plans in place to work in a coordinated way, that they will not accept that post the response phase there, has, there is a drop in level of service and support to those affected communities. Councils will lose support and their relationship with communities if they are not well positioned to maintain that level of service post the response phase. And there we go, an emergency. Are we prepared? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing. I didn't do this on purpose to emphasize my point. <laughs> 